The power of praying for other people. I was at a conference this past week with Heather and got talking to some other pastors. And, uh, you know, as we do, we like to talk about our, our kids and our families. And so we had an opportunity to engage with, with some leaders. And, and one of the pastors that was there was sharing a bit of a story about his own family. And he, he said, you know, there's one of his children, his adult children, and they were you know, making some decisions in life, had some relationships that were moving them in a direction that, you know, they were praying about. And, and so they just knew that some of the decisions that were being made were, were, was moving this individual in a place that, you know, they just knew that God had more for them. I don't, I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but this pastor was saying, yeah, and so we just, you know, we're, we've been praying for a while, but he said, I just felt prompted just to go find a place to pray. And he says, there's, there's a little kind of hill and a road near my house. I went outside and I just took some time in this spot praying. He goes, and I, I've been there before, but on this day, I felt really prompted to go there. And he says, as I begin to pray, he says, after I kind of got into it for a bit, I, I, he said, like, the only way I could describe it is that like a spirit of intercession just kind of rested on me. And, and I just really began to intercede. You know, in this case, he was praying for his son. As I just begin to intercede for my son, he says, I, I left that point of prayer, that place of prayer, with holy confidence, just knowing that no matter what, that God heard my prayer and that things were changing. And he said, you know, just a day or two later, he said he met with his son, and his son came to him. He says, you know, Dad, I don't know what's going on in my life. He says, but I feel like God is doing something in me. I feel like things are changing. I need to make some decisions in my life about my future, about my career, about my relationships. And he said it was just a reminder to him again, the power of intercessory prayer, partnering with God, praying for someone else. You see, praying for others is often called intercession or intercessory prayer. And, and this kind of prayer is, is, is about coming before the Lord for the needs of somebody else. It's coming before the Lord saying, God, I, I'm burdened for someone, and I'm asking you to move. Now, some, some of you might be here this morning and say, well, before I pray for somebody else, Pastor, don't you realize all the needs that I have? And I think that that's our first reaction often. It's like when we come to prayer, we're like, okay, God, here's my list. Here's my stuff. Here's you, God, you know all the drama that's happening in my life. And so, Lord, I'm, I'm bringing you all my needs. And that's appropriate. And the Bible says that we can bring our needs to the Lord. Jesus invites us to cast our cares, our burdens upon him. And it's right and it's appropriate for us to bring our needs to the Lord in prayer. We're going to learn more about that in our series. But part of maturing in prayer is that we learn how to intercede, how we Learn how to partner with God in praying for other people. I believe that many of us in this room today are serving the Lord because other people partnered with God to pray for you. How many would say that in your story, you were going in a direction, in a way that was away from the Lord, but it was a mother? Come on. It was a praying mother. It was a praying auntie. It was a praying uncle. It was a dad. It was somebody who stood in the gap. It said, not on my watch. I am standing in the gap. I'm praying for my son. I'm praying for my grandson. I'm praying for my daughter. I'm praying for my relative, my cousin, my aunt, my uncle. I'm praying for my friend at work. I'm standing here, Lord. And I'm, st and I'm not going to move until prayer is being felt and impacted in someone else's life. I believe that many of us are products of praying people. I know that Often people will say to me, Pastor, I'm praying for you. And I want you to know that that means so much to me. The fact that you as people in our church family would say, I'm going to take some time. I'm going to invest in prayer. I need prayer. You need prayer. We need to pray for each other. And I know that even as my grandparents passed away, my grandparents would pray for me every day. I know my mom and dad in the last few years that they would pray every day for me and for my siblings, the power of a praying mother and father. It's so powerful. But you see, God in, invites us to pray for others. 
And maturity says we got to grow beyond just praying our own needs, but, but there's a blessing. You see, God, God is wanting to mature you and I in our prayer life. And there are people that are waiting on the other side of us stepping into intercessory prayer for them. There are neighborhoods, there's a city, there's a nation. And God is calling us to partner with him in praying for things that are on his heart. Some people think, well, intercession, it's like, it's, I have to be super spiritual to be an intercessor. I wanna just let you know that you can pray, you can intercede. You don't have to arrive at some level of spirituality to be used by God in intercession, to partner with God in praying. Some people think, well, it's maybe a special gift that certain people have in the church, and that may be true, but all of us are called to intercede, to pray for other people. It's not about telling God what to do, but it's about saying, Lord, what's on your heart? And let's pray, let's, let's work together in prayer for the good of other people. You know that there's a blessing when we pray for other people. It says that when Job, when he went through all that he went through, when he prayed for his friends, even the friends that were kind of mocking him and telling him to quit, when Job prayed for his friends, he was blessed. There's a blessing when we pray for other people. So growing in intercessory prayer, it's not about doing more It's about enjoying a deeper friendship with God. It's about God inviting us to share our hearts with him as he shares his heart with us. You see, friendship involves ministry, and God invites us into the ministry of prayer and intercession. In chapter 18 of Genesis, if you have a Bible, we're going to be looking at this particular chapter. Now, I'm going to go through most of the chapter today, so if you have a a Bible or a device, I'd encourage you to open it up because we'll be highlighting certain points on the screen. But to get your Bible just to follow along with me would be, I believe, helpful for you. So Genesis 18, we see that friendship here is part of growing in intercession. And we get a glimpse of Abraham being a friend of God. It says three times in the Bible that Abraham was a friend of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, in Isaiah 41, and in James chapter 2, Abraham is called a friend of God. And I like this in Isaiah 41 in the message paraphrase. It's stated like this. God calls Abraham his friend. He says, but you, Israel are my servant. You're Jacob, my first choice. You are a descendant of my, look at this, my good friend, Abraham. I like that. And I'm reminded today that as Abraham was a friend to God in Christ, you know that Jesus calls us his friends as we obey him, as we do what he calls us to do, as we follow him, as we surrender our lives as disciples. He says, no longer, are, are you servants but, or slaves, but you are my friends? So there's this invitation to be a friend of God, to partner with him as a friend in prayer. So I'm going to read through the text, and I'm going to make some comments and some application as I read. And there are several aspects and approaches that, that I believe are highlighted here in this chapter that point to how friendship with God relates to growing in this area of intercession and praying for others. Genesis 18, starting at verse one, and the Lord appeared to him, that's Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre. And as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, said he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, three men were standing in front of him. I want to stop right there and and just point this out. Abraham, he's by his tent. Sarah's inside doing some housework in the tent or whatever she was doing. But they're kind of hanging out and they're hot afternoon and three visitors arrive. And we know that one of them was the Lord because the name here, the Lord, is Yahweh. And the other two, we find out later, were angels. And so it's the Lord in the Old Testament. 
And in the Old Testament, we often will see Jesus appear. It's a, it's a theophany or it's a Christophany. It, it, it could have very well been uh, the, Jesus himself. It was, it was at least, it was God in human form. And often Jesus will appear or the Lord will appear in the Old Testament, this, this theophany or this Christophany. And, and so the Abraham sees and he acknowledges that it's the Lord and the other two being angels. But I, I want us to see this. That it says the Lord appeared to him. Here's, here's the first thing I want us to think about when it comes to intercession. And often the Lord will initiate. The Lord just kind of showed up. The Lord just kind of called him into a place of, hey, Abraham, here I am. I know there are times in my life where, and it's times that they're true, that I'll come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to initiate some intercessory prayer. I'm going to pray about this. And so it's very right to initiate prayer. But let's remember that it's the Lord who initiated friendship with us first. It was the Lord that initiated himself first to Abraham, even in a former chapter, in chapter 12, when he called Abraham out of this occultic city of Ur that he lived in. And he said, Abraham, I want you to leave your family and just start walking that way. Just start going. It was God who initiated himself. He, he showed up. It says, and the Lord appeared to him by the Oaks of Mamre. And this place of Mamre, this Oaks of Mamre, became a very significant place in the life of Abraham. So God initiates. And these three men that showed up, it says that they sat down with him and they begin to share a time with him. And it says here in verse two, it says, when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and he bowed himself to the earth. He bowed down. Here, here's what I want us to notice. Abraham moves into a place of worship. He gives worship to the Lord. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself. He, begun, he begins to worship the Lord. So it's this place of worship. When we move into a place of praying for others, often God will put a burden on our heart for someone else. Often God will initiate that place of prayer. But as we move into that place of prayer, the invitation is to begin to worship, to begin to pour out to the Lord in intercession. He began to bow down and worship the Lord. It says here in verse three, it says, then Abraham said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself and after that you may pass on. Since you have come to your servant, so they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and he said, quick, Three seas of fine flour, knead it and, and make cakes. Come on, Sarah. The, we got some guests here. He's like, come on, get, get, get your cupcakes going. I know the Lord's going to love your cupcakes. Come on, those unleavened cupcakes that you make are amazing. And so he's like, come on, Sarah, get, get some food going, get, get the baking going. And then he goes over and it says, Abraham, then he ran to the herd and he took a calf, a, a tender and good, and he gave it to the young man. And he says, prepare quickly. In other words, he goes, get the barbecue going. The Lord's here. I'm here to serve the Lord. I'm here to worship the Lord. And then he said, then it says he took the curds of milk and of the calf and he prepared and he set it before them. And then he stood by them under the tree while they ate. I want you to notice a few things here. When, when Abraham moves to worship the Lord, he moves quickly. Quickly. He's obedient to, I, I'm here. I'm in a place, man, the Lord's put this burden on my heart. And God's up to something, because we'll see in the, at the end of the chapter here, God's moving him to a place of intercession. But God begins to initiate, saying, hey, I'm here. And, he, and, and, and Abraham's response then is like, okay, Lord, you got my heart. You got, what, are you, what, what are we up to? What are we doing together here, Lord? You, you got my heart. And he moves quickly. Now, Abraham was almost 100 years old. Now, I'll tell you right now, I'm in my 50s, and there are mornings Maybe even this morning, I can either confirm or deny, it may have been this morning, early. When I got up, I did not move very quickly out of my bed. Anybody with me? My body is feeling it already. But Abraham, he says, it's the Lord. And his 90-some-year-old body, he's like, here we go. 
I'm here to serve the Lord. I want you to know it's not only did he move quickly, but he gave generously. He's like, come on, Sarah, make those cupcakes. Those are the best cupcakes there are in the Holy Land. Make them, bake them. And he goes and he gets his calf, the best, a good calf. He gets the, the best meat. He's like, I'm not even going to Costco for this meat. I'm going down. I'm going down to the Jerusalem butcher himself. And I'm going to get him to cut the finest piece of meat. And we're going to get the barbecue going because I'm not giving God my leftovers. So he comes into a place of honoring the Lord quickly with generosity. And then it says he stood by and he waited on the Lord. I love this as he ministers to the Lord. It says that Samuel, when he was a young man in the Bible, Eli was in his usual place. But Samuel... He slept by the altar, by the presence. And it says that Samuel, he was the one who ministered unto the Lord. You see, there's a call in a place of intercession to minister, take some time as we feel that burden to pray, that we start our prayer, we take some time to say, Lord, you've put this burden on my heart, and Lord, now I just want to worship you. This is part of the joy, this is part of the friendship of intercession where we take time, say, Lord, I'm going to give you my best. I want to find myself in your presence. I want to find myself in a place of, of worship to you. It says that Samuel ministered unto the Lord. So oftentimes we get so busy, listen to this, we get so busy doing things for the Lord that we forget to stop and minister unto the Lord. There's a powerful place when we bring our worship to the Lord, and this is what intercession and prayer calls us into. It says in Acts 13 that as they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, could it be that as we come to a place of intercession and we take that time to worship and honor the Lord in worship, that God has something to say to you? I believe there's something that God wants to say, and it's in a place of receptivity. It's in a place of worship where our ears are attuned to what the Holy Spirit is saying and where our heart is moved to what is moving the very heart of God. It says that they ministered to the Lord. They worshiped the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, set aside Barnabas and Saul. So picking up here then in verse nine. Then they said to him, well, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, well, she's in the tent making cupcakes. And the Lord said, well, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah, it says, was listening at the door, at the tent door behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am a worn out person, and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? So Sarah's saying, listen, I'm old. <laughs> Abraham, he used to be a hunk of a man, but he ain't so much a hunk of a man. Nothing's happening. In other words, nothing's happening here. I mean, Abraham, he's cute and all, but we're not going to have, we're not making babies. <laughs> That's a long time ago. I mean, we're sleeping in separate beds and everything. I mean, we got these like snoring machines. Like it's, it's bad, okay? Like th- nothing's happening here, all right? So, so, and if you have a snoring machine, it's okay. <laughs> There's still hope. Okay. <laughs> so the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Look at this, verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You see, at that point in time, he said, I will return, and by this time next year, Sarah shall have a son. See, this is the other principle in intercession. Expect miracles from the Lord. When we intercede, we're, we're burdened by God. We're drawn into that place. We say, Lord, what are, you, what are you up to? And we worship so we can hear, so we can minister to his heart, so we can align our hearts. But then it's like, all right, God, as I'm interceding here, when I'm, I'm praying for other people, I'm praying for family members, I'm praying for this city, I'm pray- Lord, I'm expecting you to move miraculously. Is anything too hard for the Lord? What a question. It's rhetorical. There's nothing too hard for God. It doesn't matter how hard or bleak the situation might look for you right now in your life, whatever you're believing for in your family, whatever you're believing for in this city. 
You know, Adam in prayer this morning mentioned to us that some of the new statistics that have come out about Canada, about faith in Canada, that about 53 or 54% of Canadians now say, I have no need for any kind of faith at all, that I'm just fine on my own. And that's a record in this country where there are so many people that are just saying, they're just checking out in faith. But how many know that the harvest is ripe? How many know that there is such a spiritual hunger today? And that when we look at it in the natural, we think, God, could you move on this city? But a heart of intercession, a heart that that longs for revival, a heart that, that beats with God's heart says, there's nothing impossible with God. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nobody too far gone from God. There's no sin. There's no brokenness. There's no pain. There's no cold heart that is too far away from God to reach. God's arm is not shortened that he cannot reach and touch, and move, and help, and heal, and save. God's arm of saving is not too short. And he can reach into every situation, every heart. As we intercede, we should come to the place of expecting miracles. Well, this is very interesting because it says that Sarah laughed. She's like, (laughs) this is impossible. I think we see ourselves a little bit in Sarah's laugh. Have you ever looked at something? It's just, that's impossible. That's That's crazy. But you know, here's the encouraging thing for me. Even though Sarah laughed, how many know the answer still came? (laughs) She she still had the promised child. She she still had Isaac. Come on. And even in our weakness, even in our faith, the Bible says, even when we are faithful, guess what? God remains faithful. God remains sovereign. Even when we lack faith, he could still work a miracle. But here's what I also think happened. It says Abraham, when he was first given this, this, that the the families of the earth would be blessed. It says that Abraham laughed, laughed as well. Abraham laughed, but his laugh, I believe, was a laugh of faith. And I believe that his laugh of faith set something in motion for Sarah. And here's the thing. We got to come into a position in alignment with God and, and let that laughter of faith, like my friend who was praying on the hill for his son, he, he said, I, something happened. And, and I believe that God wants to move us into a place of intercession where we just say, there is nothing too hard for the Lord. And I'll let a laugh of faith rise up in our heart and say, I see the enemy faltering. I see the enemy being pushed back. I see the enemy's schemes failing over the life of my son, my child, my grandchild, my my friend, my neighbor. I see the enemy's plans being turned on itself. And I believe that what's going to happen even in this season, like in the Old Testament, sometimes the enemy army would just implode and turn on itself. I believe as we move into a place of intercession, that that's when we can just laugh and joy and just say, God, you are doing this. Because there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Expect miracles from the Lord. Wow. Verse 16, then the men set out from there. And they looked down towards Sodom and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And this was custom in this culture that when you have visitors, you would walk with them for a while. You would kind of like, you know, I guess we would walk somebody to our car, you know, like especially on a cold, like they would walk them down the road. It was customary. It was hospitality. But this is where we have the story of the Lord destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom, one of the cities in this this valley, in this area of Sodom, is a word that has become synonymous with sexual perversion, even in our culture today. We see it six times in the Old Testament. We see it four times in the New Testament. But Ezekiel kind of pulls back the curtain a little bit and gives us a bit of a peek of what was going on in the hearts of the people that were to be judged for their their sin and their, their wickedness. It says in Ezekiel 16, it says that they were overfed that they were unconcerned, that they they did not lift a finger to help the poor and the needy. They were haughty, and they did detestable things before the Lord. You see, the sin of Sodom included pride and apathy and complacency and self-absorption. And I think that the root of, of lust and 
perversion is really just a, a, an over focus on self. That's, that, I think that's that the root. Sometimes we look at the outward action, but I think people that are given to such perversity that it starts in a place of complacency and haughtiness and pride, pride against God. God says in his word that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And there's a healthy pride, but there in our world today is an unhealthy pride of haughtiness of spirit against God. And and the Bible says that God opposes that. But here's our God. He gives grace to the humble. And the humble is the one that calls out for mercy. And the one one that cries out and says, oh God, I I, I want friendship with you. I, I want to know you. I want salvation. I need salvation because I am a mess without you, God. I am lost without you, God. It comes from a place of humility. It's completely the opposite of pride. And verse 17 says then, The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? You see, judgment and justice was coming. And seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In other words, the Lord, it's like he's talking to himself here a little bit, like, hey, should I show Abraham what's going on? And the Lord's kind of like, I want to just bring him in on the secrets of what's going to happen here. You see, I'm going to destroy this wickedness and I'm going to start again with Abraham, with this promise, with this blessing. And today, you and me, uh, we, we are children of Abraham spiritually in that sense that all those blessings of Abraham are ours in Christ Jesus. Some of you are thankful for that. That the Lord said, saw through the broken and the wickedness of that time. And he says, I'm still going to raise up Abraham to be a blessing. And obviously through Christ was that ultimate fulfillment that in Christ we receive the blessing of God, the mercy of God, that our sin and our evil and our wickedness is shown mercy because of Jesus Christ. So the Lord said, I'm not gonna hide this from Abraham. I'm gonna bring him in on the secrets of my heart. It says, verse 22, so the men turned from there and they went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord and Abraham drew near. Here's the principle Be still and draw near to the Lord. Especially when you don't know what's coming up. Especially when you don't know what God's got in his heart. You say, Lord, I don't understand everything that's happening here right now, but I'm going to be still and know that you are God. I'm just going to wait in your presence and trust, Lord, your heart in this situation. How many times have you had to trust God's heart in your situation? Then it says in verse 23, "Then, then Abraham said... He says, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And he starts almost like bargaining with God here. He says, suppose there are 50 righteous in the city. Will you sweep away that place and not spare it for 50 righteous who are in it? Then he says, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. He says, far be it. From you, Lord, to do this, shall not, look at this, shall not the judge of the earth, of all the earth, do what is just? So Abraham's saying, Lord, I know that your heart is good. I know, Lord, that you are a holy God and that sin must be judged. But Lord, I also know this to be true about you, that you're a God who shows mercy, that you're a God that is slow to anger and abounding in compassion and love. And Abraham's saying, like, God, I know this to be true about you. So he begins to almost like bargain with the Lord, but he doesn't do it in a haughty way. He's not trying to show God what to do or tell God what to do, but it's a reminder that friendship is the context of deep intercession with the Lord, of growing intercession with the Lord. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And so the Lord said, verse 26, the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And then Abraham goes on and he begins to say, well, Lord, what if there's 45? What if there's 40? What if, what if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if, and then he says, verse 32, then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak again. But this once, he says, suppose, Lord, 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way 
And when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham then returned to his place. You see, this is where we have to trust God's heart even when we don't know what's going on. We trust his heart. We trust his heart, Lord. I I don't know, Lord, what's going on here, but I trust that you're good. And as he intercedes, He's interceding for just even 10 people. He's like, Lord, I know that the city is wicked, but I I know there's 10 people. And it says that there was an outcry that came up to the Lord of the wickedness of Sodom. Whether that outcry was Lot crying out to God or whether it was Abraham himself crying out because it was so broken and wicked. Abraham knew that his relative was there. And most scholars believe that Lot's family was about 10 people. And Abraham knew, he's like, there's a lot of wickedness in that city, but I know that even though Lot, he made some mistakes, he, he, he's, he's, you know, he only goes to church like twice a year. He, you know, he's, he cheats on his taxes, he does a bunch of bad stuff, but I know somehow in his heart, Lord, that there, he's, he's still, relatively in comparison to all that, he's still righteous, God, would you have mercy on my relative? Would you have mercy? Would you have mercy on my family? And the Lord had mercy, and the Lord showed mercy, and Lot and his family were saved. And it's about trusting God's heart in that place of intercession, saying, Lord, I know that your heart is good. And intercession leads us again to a place where we say, Lord, I know. I know you're good. I know you're good. So Abraham steps in, and he begins to intercede. And God shows both justice and mercy because that's who he is. And finally, by praying for others, we become more like the Lord. Here's the principle. By praying for others, we become more like Jesus. This is why God is calling us to grow in this area of praying for others, of intercession. We, we become, we're, Warren Wiersbe said this, he says, we are never more like the Lord than we are when, when we are interceding for others. This is when we're like the Lord. Why? Because Jesus himself is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. How many are thankful that Jesus is interceding for you and for me? How many are thankful that all the the brokenness and, you know, Sodom is a picture in so many ways of our own sin nature. It's our own brokenness. It's our own wickedness. It's our own rebellion. It's our own pride and haughtiness towards God. But it's a picture of of Jesus on that cross, standing there in the middle of time, in that Kairos moment, standing with outstretched arms, looking at those who are piercing him and, and, and crucifying him and praying that prayer to the Father. Father, he's interceding. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. It's a picture of Jesus. As we look at this intercessory heart of Abraham. It's a picture of our Lord saying, oh, Father, forgive them. Lord, spare them. Show mercy. And in your wrath, oh God, remember mercy. In your wrath, oh God, remember grace. Remember. The Bible says that because of Christ, because he died on that cross, that we don't any longer have to pay the penalty of our sin and our brokenness. But when we put our sin on that cross, Jesus absorbs it all. And he says, no longer are you an object of wrath, like it says in Ephesians. But now God has shown you his mercy. His mercy. And so, as we move into the power of praying for others, we're reminded that Jesus is praying for us. And as we pray for others, we become more and more like our Lord.